Hello and welcome to this video tutorial from BlenderCookie.com. My name is Jonathan Williamson and today we're going to be taking a little bit of a different route than normal and I'm going to be giving you a bit more of a reference video versus a instructional video. So what we're going to be doing today is giving you a overview of the topology needed to create a human head. We're not going to be doing any kind of modeling or anything like that. Instead I'm going to be stri focusing strictly on the topology and the edge loops of a human head and where to place each of those. Now, if you're not sure on how to model, you know, doing all the modeling stuff, whatnot, feel free to go ahead and check out the other tutorials we have on BlenderCookie.com. We have a full, complete head modeling series that goes through the entire modeling process along with the edge loops. But this is meant more as one that you can use as a reference without having to go through the entire modeling process. So I'm going to be using this model here that I created a while back as a reference. And if we go into edit mode, you can see that it has very clean topology. Everything is flowing nicely following the general mu muscle structure of the face, providing me lots of detail in which I can form the features of the face, create accurate anatomy and whatnot. But let's go ahead and look at this just piece by piece and see how it's structured. So first off, let's just start with the eyes. And you'll notice that if I go in and just alt right click on these loops, you can see that I've got all continuous edge loops throughout this entire face. And this is one of the key parts here in that there's no triangles, everything is mostly evenly spaced, I don't have any huge long rectangular faces or anything like that. And so this all, all these edge loops allow me to very easily change features on the face, you know, if I want to change her expression, change her anatomy, you name it. So I think as I've told you before the the key to topology is keeping mostly circular loops that are following the muscle structure of the face. And you can see that this is working pretty well here. We've got the muscles coming down around here, down around the mouth, the muscles of the mouth, down the neck, etc. So like I said, we're going to start one by one. And you can see on the eyes here, we've got our circular loops, which allow us to form the any kind of shape on the eye that we want allows us to change the expression, move the eyelids up and down, anything like that. But it also allows us to select the entire eye such that if we want to then maybe turn on proportional editing, grab it, we can then move the entire eye around and very quickly change things like we want. Same thing on the nose. We have a single circular loop that's falling around the nose, circular loop around the nostrils, coming down around next to the mouth and down to the chin, circular loops around the lips and the mouth. All of these allow us to very easily do anything that we need to do. We've got circular loop coming from the chin all the way up along here. And this is even more clearly demonstrated if we go into face mode and select face loops at a time by alt right clicking on one of the edges perpendicular to it. And we can see that we, ha we have these entire face loops going on. And these are really what allow us to have utmost control of the face. But this may be a little confusing right now because all you, you know, you're seeing, we've got all these different loops and whatnot, but this doesn't really give you much in terms of how do you create your own. Well, I've gone ahead and prepared a couple other models on another layer. First off, here is the same model with most of the main face loops colored. So you can see I've got main loop here which starts right in here and then extrudes in each loop is just another um, continuous circle extruded in from this edge to form the, the lips. Same thing on the nose, around the eye. We've got a loop coming in from the forehead down to the across the cheekbone from the forehead down to the edge of the ear, along the jawbone, and along the back of the head. And all of these loops help direct our polyflow, just so you can see that we've got these face loops here are then being extruded one, two, three, and on, on back to get this nice cone or um, dome shape to the head. And then along the back of the head as well, we've got circular loops around the the neck that allow us to have a circular form here, but then we have a pole that's right here that allows us to redirect the polyflow here and here to continue these two shapes. Same thing along the neck, 
you know, we start off with a circle here and down to here, and then we have another pole right there that then splits this off to get the neck muscles and the neck muscles here, leaving us this area, which we can then fill in for the clavicle and whatnot. And then let's go ahead and look at some of the other poles that we have. And when I say a pole, I mean a vertex with more than four edges connected to it. So you can see this one has five, and five, five, and you should never have more than five edges connected to a single vertex. And even then, you know, even with five, you want to be very, very careful on where those poles go. And I'll talk about that here in a second, but let's go ahead and look at a few more. You can see we've got one here that redirects the flow along the the jawbone and around the cheeks. There's another one right beneath the nose that's redirecting this up and around the nose and here so that we can form the nostril. Uh, we've got one on the, should have one on the cheekbone, if I can find it. Here it is, right here. So we've got this flow coming down to form the creases here next to the mouth and beneath the cheekbones and then around the eyes. So again, we're splitting it off. So poles work really well to control your topology. We've got another one right here. And so basically, what, what you, an easy way to think of it is if you have two muscle flows, such as this one and this one, we've got these coming around great, and we can create, the, create those very, very easily. But then we've got one flow coming around and another one going down, and then we have a split right here. It's right at that split where you'll always place the pole. And so you know you can see the same thing here. We've got muscles coming down, muscles going around, or bone, you know, just main structures underneath the skin. And then it splits once more to give us this flat area, which by putting a pole right there, we can split it very, very easily. And so although you want to be very conscious of where you place your poles, they can be very, very helpful to control your topology and whatnot. Okay. So this is a, a full head model with a lot of the main loops outlined. But let's take a look at the same head model, but that's been stripped down. So we can zoom over to layer four here, and we can see that obviously it's a very, very simple model, but we've still got all the primary loops. We've got this one coming from the jawbone, over the top of the head, around the eyes, from the bridge of the nose, down to the mouth, or chin, around the mouth, around the neck, across the, the edge of the neck and around the base of the neck. So these are all of our, a lot of our main loops that are controlling this. And you can see we've still got the same primary poles. We've got a pole here, right about the jawbone beneath the ear. We've got one right at the um, edge of the cheekbone. We've got one right there between the jaw and the cheeks here. We've got one right below the nose. And so our edge flow is still very, very similar. And you can imagine that this would be a mesh that you might start with, which point you could then start adding in edge loops to start adding in detail any way that you want, or perhaps you would use this as a sculpting base, you know, anything that you wanted to do as long as you had your edge loops set up correctly first. And so this is a very good example of how even on a simple mesh, our edge loops are still very, very similar and should be, you know, they should still be very much the same. And now some of you may be thinking, well, wait a second, is there any kind of concrete rule in terms of how the edge loops are structured? And this is a very, you know, kind of an iffy question because there's a yes and no answer. Yes, they should follow a general form in that around the eyes, around the bridge of the nose, to the chin, around the mouth, etc. But you can have variations on that. Say, for example, let's look at this one again. And you can see that this green loop could come down through here and go back up to the bridge of the nose without causing any problems. It would all depend on how dense you wanted your mesh to be. So for example, if I split this, and then I could fill these edge loops, and then I would redirect this flow here along here, you know, and then do a bit more work, you could do that. And it would work just fine. What it would do would then move your pole a little further down. In some cases, this isn't always going to work. You know, you need to be careful where you're placing things like this because my general rule of thumb on poles, at least, has always been place it somewhere where either the skin is meant to pinch 
or where you're not going to see very much movement. So areas like, you know, the, the brow right here, it's going to naturally pinch when someone squints their eyes to pull in right here to pinch the skin. Or if someone scrunches up their nose, this area in here is going to pinch. This area along the jawbone isn't going to see a lot of transformation. You know, you'll have this area in here will inflate and whatnot as you change your expression. And so, uh, or this area here is hardly ever going to change at all, except maybe when you turn your head at extreme angles. And so you want to be sure that regardless of your edge flow, that you place them in such a way that they're not going to disrupt your mesh and disrupt the way that your model works. Because remember that whether you intend to animate your model or not, the key while modeling is to make it such that you can animate it. You know, a non-animatable model is, for most purposes, worthless. You know, obviously you're going to have that occasional project where no animation is necessary, you're strictly doing it as an art piece or still, you name it, where animation is never going to be needed. But I highly encourage you to always make your models ready to animate and such that they could be easily rigged, easily, um, easily add expression to them and whatnot, such that it gives you practice and you never know when you're going to reuse a model. One of the things, as particularly as a freelance artist, but just as a 3D artist in general, a lot of times we find ourselves reusing older models and whether it's reusing it as a base mesh or reusing it in its part or entirety doesn't necessarily matter it all depends on the project but if you make a model that looks great but is not animatable and you need it for another project where it would have fit perfectly style wise but since it's not animatable all of a sudden it's worthless and you have to then go in put in all those extra hours to recreate something of nearly the exact same form, but that can be used. So, you know, it's always good practice to make something with good topology, make something that's going to work well for just about any case, and it's just good practice in general. You know, one of the things with good topology is that it's tough. It is a tough modeling challenge from a, you know, everything from a technical to a knowledge aspect. You've got to know a lot of what you're, you're doing, and you've got to have a pretty good skill set in order to do it. Because, you know, this it's not just a matter of extruding a bunch of cubes and shapes and just kind of roughing out the form. No, you've got a lot of different, you know, just look at some of these edge flows. We've got these coming back, change this direction here, change this direction there, here, coming around, change this direction, change this direction, direction here. You know, we've got all these different areas that this mesh is, you know, it's literally a map versus just a, a grid. And so... It's both a technical and a, I guess you could say, a knowledgeable challenge in knowing what you're doing and having the ability to do that. So I highly encourage you to always work towards good topology, but also, you know, whether you're doing it just for yourself or somebody else, it's always good practice. Okay, so that's pretty much it. You know, let's just go ahead and kind of recap. Um, going over to the simple model here, and you can see that, again, the main loops are those from the forehead down to the chin, from the chin to the bridge of the nose, around the eyes. Uh, a lot of times you'll see one that comes from the forehead down to the chin or above, above the mouth. In this case, I don't completely have one. You know, I've got it kind of close with this structure here, but it's not exact. And that's one of the things where I was saying how things can vary a little bit. Uh, without necessarily causing any problems because you know this will still deform just as well as one that had this complete flow if I were to merge this there going along you know it would still probably deform just as well it kind of comes down down to personal preference but so we've got those main forms we got it around the eyes the mouth and each of these not only allow us to animate it very easily but also like I said add in more detail very easily like I demonstrated with the eye. And so this is the main topology of the head. I will be following up the, this video with some more videos um, detailing the topology of hopefully each of the major portions of the body. Uh, when this will happen I can't guarantee but it's definitely something that is on the to-do list. 
you know, pending, of course, the reaction from this video, of course, as always. But again, this is the topology overview of the human head. I hope you found this helpful. And please, if you have any questions, particularly related directly to topology, uh, do not hesitate to comment on the video uh, from BlenderCookie.com, or you can send us an email or support ticket from our support page. And uh, please also, if you have any um, topology resources that you like in particular that you think other people, particularly other beginner artists, would find helpful, again, do not hesitate to post them. You know, everyone can always use more and more references, which that's another thing that brings to mind when when learning topology. It can be a struggle. It really can be. And topology is something that you have to spend a long time to not only understand, but a long time to also master and to be able to create it without even thinking. You know, once you get to that point where you are secure enough in your topology knowledge and your modeling ability, you shouldn't have to reference other models to see how to form the topology on your own. You should be able to just create it without even thinking. And when I say without even thinking, you should basically be able to, to model something and just start laying out all the pieces without even taking the topology into effect and have it just work. Because it's so ingrained in you that you know how the topology is supposed to work and so you just create it out of habit more than anything. Uh, but when, when learning topology to try and get to this point and to continue building that foundation, one of the single best things I can tell you to do is study other people's work. Go check out artists like Pascal Blanc, Steven Stauberg, Francisco Cortina, um, various people like that. A lot of the, the masters on CG Society to Blender artists to, you know, wherever. Look at their wireframes. Regardless of whether the final piece is good or not, study their wireframes and look at how they did it look at where they placed uh, their poles, where they placed their edge loops, and things like that, particularly um, animations. You know, look at high poly animated models and see how they did it, because that's where you really need to look. You know, some, some people like to, when they're just producing still work, like to kind of forego a lot of the general um, topology rules, general rule of thumbs, because with a still model, you can get away with it. I know Steven Stauberg, for one, actually, uh, incredible artist, but he tends to put a lot of triangles and things like that in his work, which is fine since he produces just still animation or still pieces. He doesn't do a lot of animation. And so for that purpose, it's okay, mostly because he knows what he's doing and he can get away with it. As long as you know what you're doing and you know why you're doing it, triangles aren't necessarily a problem. Now, I know some of you may be saying, wait, what? I know Jonathan has said before, you know, never, never, never use triangles. And as a general rule of thumb, this is true. And I'm not going to get a whole lot into that because I know I've talked about it a lot in previous videos. But what I'm saying is study other people's work. You know, particularly those people that are very renowned for what they do and really know what they're doing. Study their topology, re try and recreate their topology, and then once you're able to recreate that topology, try and create that same topology or similar topology from scratch from your head or following a reference, you name it. But, you know, that's one of the things that if you want to be a particularly a successful character artist, but a successful 3D artist in many, many different areas, mastering topology is absolutely crucial. So I'm going to leave you there, and uh, happy blending as always, and if you have any questions once more, please do not feel, f I mean, please feel free to drop a comment, contact us, whatever is necessary, and we'll try and get back to you. Thanks again for watching.